Woo, baby. Welcome into the program, everyone. This is the Farsi Show presented by Steven Singer Jewelers. And my name is Mark Farzetta. We're going to get you ready one step closer to the World Series with the Phillies and Astros. We're going to get you ready for Sixers tonight as they take on the Toronto Raptors, 730 north of the border. It'll be up there in Toronto. And a little behind-the-scenes look at Jeff Stoutland. Now, I have, believe it or not, uh, over the last couple of days here, now that we haven't had baseball and we're just anticipating the World Series, um, I went uh, on the Eagles website and I said, you know, what can I I feed myself to to give myself a little bit of taste of the Eagles, a little Eagles football during the bye week? And I saw this interview with Fran Duffy there of uh, Eagles.com. Uh, and I watched uh, Jason Kelsey. Uh, he was mic'd up uh, behind the scenes there. That was great. But the Jeff Stoutland thing is really what jumped out to me because Jeff Stoutland, the Eagles offensive line coach, is kind of this enigma that a lot of people know the name Jeff Stoutland. A lot of people praise the name Jeff Stoutland. A lot of people really don't know Jeff Stoutland. I mean, I've watched press conferences with him before. I find him to be hilarious other than great at his job. But whenever I watch the man, I'm always amused by him. And there was one particular clip I'm going to play for you today but with a behind-the-scenes interview where he gives you a look uh, into Jordan Mailata. So we'll discuss that as well. Uh, Mattress Mac is at it again. The famed mattress salesman in Houston always likes to make the big bet. And now he is making the biggest bet with the poss- possibly the biggest payout in sports betting history and it is not pro Philadelphia Philly, as you would assume. Man from Houston, a humanitarian, I might add, is at it again with another huge bet. And this one could have the biggest payout in sports betting history. So we got all that for you today. Evan Macy from phillyvoice.com joins the program to talk all things World Series. So we'll get involved in that conversation. But, man, let me just start with this because it's a personal thing. Uh, it had been a minute since I um, uh, really delved into any hot sauce. Just a little thing about me. I uh, love hot sauce. I love uh, the spice, right? I love that stuff. And, oh, my goodness. Yesterday, my wife said, uh, hey, I'm in the mood for tacos. And I said, I, I can do tacos. So she ordered tacos. And she goes, hey, the, the, uh, the, the sauce, what kind of sauce do you want on that? And I'm thinking, well, I got sriracha at home. I'll just use a little sriracha sauce. You know, a little tang. I like a little tang, a little tang. I don't know what the hell this thing was yesterday. But you got the hottest sauce available from this place. I don't know if you guys like spice. I don't know if you guys like hot things. But um, I'll just say, there a while about a while back uh, when I was on the radio with uh, Josh Innes and uh, our producer extraordinaire Adam Regner, uh, he suggested this bit called hot takes, where we would take a a bite of a ghost pepper, a raw ghost pepper, if we. Uh, answered a question wrong basically and it was it's like a sports trivia question and we took a bite and uh, that was the hottest thing spiciest thing the the like that was torture okay that was terrible this yesterday was the closest thing to that they called this sauce like el macho or something like that uh and it's yeah it's probably for guys like me that are just like oh i can have that sauce but let me tell you today i woke up this morning still feeling it all right i had it at six 15 last night this morning around 4 a.m oh baby still a little tang on the tongue there oh and i have i had milk i had bread you know i even tried and i thought this would be a good idea uh for two reasons one just because i love peanut butter and the other i was like oh well that'll coat the mouth and that'll make it feel better holy lord don't ever take peanut butter as a medicinal purpose to try to get rid of any spice you have in your, your tongue oh it was it's like spread it was like a grease fire in, in my mouth it was insane but um i tell you this to, to let you know that i'm playing hurt today folks i'm playing hurt i can still feel the tang oh it got me it got me good but not as good as the phillies you need to get the astros ah you know i was thinking about this today and this could make no sense whatsoever but it made sense to me the uh the philadelphia phillies in my mind right now are in an interesting situation where i feel like Bryce Harper is the best player in this series. And that might be to some people like a no duh type of situation. But I catch myself looking at this Phillies team with great anticipation for game one, almost as if it's not even a baseball team, but it's a basketball team. And in basketball, one player can take over a series. 
it can become, you know, the LeBron series, you know, it can become the Kobe series. It can become, you know, that what the best player on the court can take the game over and not even just the game, but, but an entire series, if you're riding that hot hand and baseball, as I got into the other day is a very individualized team sport, as we all know. But the interesting thing is that you can step to the plate and create offense with, with one swing of the bat, you can put a run on the board. And I feel like with Bryce Harper, and I feel like right now with even Reese Hoskins, certainly with Kyle Schwarber, I feel like the Phillies have that ability to have that instant offense. And as I'm looking at pitchers like uh, 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 Valdez, I'm looking at Verlander, I'm looking at those two guys, for instance, just to start things out in this series. The first thing that's coming to mind is capitalizing on those mistakes. And I got into that yesterday with the fact that you could do that with this Phillies lineup. But the guy that I think separates the Phillies from the Astros is Bryce Harper. Is If Bryce Harper, who seems to me to be that kid that was on your team, now maybe you were that kid on the team. So if you were, thanks for the wins because you were carrying my ass that whole time. But it seems like that kid in, in Little League, in grade school, that just mashed, man. He could will victories. He could go up there and hit and just bring home the W's and plate the runs to bring home the W's. And that's what Bryce Harper seems like right now. When you're getting on base at a 460 on base percentage, you're hitting at a 430, you're hitting bombs, you're driving in runs like he has been doing throughout this uh, the postseason to this point. I feel like that's the guy beyond a shadow. Adam of a doubt that will be the difference maker. And I'll ask guests throughout the week. I, I ask Kevin Mays, you know, what do the Phillies need to do to win this series? Matt Breen will join us uh, Thursday or should be Friday. They'll preview this series as well. Uh, I'll ask uh, Scott Ayer is supposed to join the show tomorrow. Former Phillies relief pitcher from the 2008 World Series team. He's supposed to join us tomorrow. I'm asking everybody this question. What do the Phillies have to do to win? The Phillies will win the World Series if they do this. And I think the number one thing before I get everybody else's take on that, the number one thing is Bryce Harper has to continue to mash. And the thing that really got me thinking about the whole, the, the idea of like willing victories and all that was when Bryce Harper went back to the bench in what was it, game one of, of the, the playoffs against the St. Louis Cardinals. And he went back to the bench and we're not losing. We are not losing. And since then, he has basically willed victories. And it's funny, that was the one game he didn't hit a home run. <laughs> it gets wild. But, you look at this the whole thing with uh, with the Phillies, and right now, Bryce Harper, without question, as the NLCS MVP, the postseason MVP, essentially, he's the guy that's going to keep this ship going. And I have never looked at baseball like I've I've never looked at any sport like I've looked at basketball, where one guy can take it all over and one guy can change everything. This is probably the best case, uh, Sarah, the, the 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 best example in sports of a guy just being able to change the momentum. Like I, when I was watching Barry Bonds play against the angels in that world series of what? Oh, two. I would, I wasn't even looking at Barry Bonds as the guy that was going to carry the San Francisco giants. Maybe because I'm not a big Barry Bonds fan, but I look right now at Bryce Harper is the guy that will carry this team. You have other guys that could get hot. The Nick Cassiano's thing. I'm always going to hold out hope for that. He just all of a sudden turns it on. Uh, but guys like Reese Hoskins, who have been mashing, and certainly guys like uh, Kyle Schwarber, who have been getting it done as well, are guys I'm going to be looking at in this series to be the difference makers. But the number one guy that I think will change the course and the tide of this series, if the Phillies do find themselves you know, down 2 you nothing know, late in the ball game, it's going to be Bryce Harper getting to the plate to change things. That's going to be the guy that I think everyone's going to be relying on. And I have never in baseball looked at one guy to be the difference maker. I mean, I even look at it from a pitching standpoint, Obviously, you're not seeing that at every on every day. But when I looked at Cole Hamels in 2008, I thought, well, that's a win. They got Cole Hamels. That's a win. That's how I felt every time he took the mound. That's why he was your, that's why he was your postseason and World Series MVP. But, man, it is, it is wild to think about the idea that you're going to have Bryce Harper out there willing this team to victory. I am – I'm feeling more confident about this. I'm acknowledging that the Houston Astros are the favorite. And it's funny to say that I look at a team like the Astros and acknowledge that they're the favorite. And I look at a team like the Phillies and of course I'm pulling for them to win, but I am certainly not ruling them out. And as I've said earlier in this week, I, if this series 
Uh, I think it's going to be a very close series game by game, but I don't think it's going to be a six or seven game series. And if the Phillies are going to win this series, it's going to be on the bats. It's not going to be on the arms. It's going to be clutch hitting. There's going to be a lot of 3-2 games. 2-1 games is how I feel. There might be one breakout 9-8 to eight game. But my vibe going into this series is that the Phillies win this series. And I know it goes against all humanity, but I just can't help shake the idea that Bryce Harper is going to take this thing over. It's been talked about a lot already with Bryce Harper having the swing of his life. When it comes to that two-run home run uh, that he hit in game five against the San Diego Padres to put the Phillies up and give them the win ultimately. he He's playing his whole life, not just for that swing. He's playing his whole life for this series against the Astros. And I think he's the best player on the field. And I think the best player on the field is going to have a huge impact on this series. And I look forward to watching the uh, Phillies win the World Series and us party on Broad Street again, which is incredible to think about. Anyone in my age range that doesn't remember anything for 27 years? <laughs> then all of a sudden, the Phillies win the World Series. The Eagles win the Super Bowl. Oh, it's some good times right there. It's some good times right there. Now, I, of course, am looking at this and saying that the Phillies are going to win this. Uh, and it goes against all the experts and all that stuff, even though a lot of the experts will have, uh, as I've acknowledged on the show, a lot of the experts have acknowledged the idea of a team of destiny, right? I'm saying to hell with destiny. Bryce Harper's going to win this World Series for the Phillies. That's what I say. Now, am I willing to put $10 million on that? No. I'm not even willing to put $10,000 on that. All right? But Mattress Mac, all right? Jim, I'm going to say Mickingvale? Mackingvale? Mackingvale, I assume. Uh, Mattress Mac, the mattress salesman from Houston, Texas, Famous sports better as well, and humanitarian. I don't want. I don't let the record show that I am acknowledging that during the uh, the, the awful floods in Houston a few years ago, mattress matches had people coming in and sleeping on the mattresses in a store. I got all these beds. Might as well use them. Love that. Good for you. But Mattress Mac has made million dollar bets on things before. Mattress Mac bet on Tom Brady. Mattress Mac bet on Tom Brady to beat the Kansas City Chiefs, and he won. He won a lot of money. I forget how much he won, but this time around, he put $10 million on the Houston Astros to beat the Philadelphia Phillies in the World Series. $10 million. And if he wins, the payout is $75 million, which on record is the largest payout in sports betting history. Meanwhile, this guy, okay, $10 million on to win $75 million. I'm, I just have a really good feeling the Phillies are going to win. <laughs> Not putting 10000 on it even, but uh, anytime the mattress back does something, I'm like, oh, all right, well, how confident am I? And I'm riding the high of Bryce Harper. And damn, feels good. Uh, Phillies and Astros, we'll have more on that with Evan Macy coming up in just a second. Let me tell you uh, right now about the, uh, Jeff Stoutland. I want to get to this. Because I know for a lot of people, Jeff Stoutland is kind of this enigma. Uh, people don't really know too much about him. But I feel like anytime we get a little behind-the-scenes look at Jeff Stoutland, we should take advantage of it. And uh, one of the things that I really liked was anytime he addresses the media, it kind of gives us that little behind-the-scenes look. Uh, but I caught this thing with Fran Duffy the other day on um, Eagles.com, and I thought this would be a good time to get into it. He talked about Jordan Mailata going up against the uh, Detroit Lions. And in the piece, which is about eight minutes, I want to say, he talks about different uh, techniques of the offensive line. He talks about uh, Jason Kelsey's ability. He talks about guys like Devontae Smith. If you remember the Miles Sanders touchdown run uh, where he ran up the middle uh, against um, uh, the, 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 their last game here before the bye week. My mind is going blank here. Um, but Devontae Smith had a great block on the outside, and he showed the enthusiasm of Devontae Smith making that block. It's like he's a big part of that touchdown, even though he doesn't get a stat. He's a big part of the block and a big part of that touchdown. You see how excited he is that he held his block to make sure Miles Sanders can run him for the touchdown. So it shows Jason Kelsey getting off of uh, the line of scrimmage to make a block up field. It was great. But the thing that really blew me away was how we talked about Jordan Mailata. Because if you're Jeff Stoutland, one of the biggest uh, bragging rights of your career has to be the success of Jordan Mailata. Because you got raw talent. You got power. You got size. 
and Jordan Mailata coming into the NFL. And when Jeff Stoutland worked him out, I believe it was down in Florida uh, for the international uh, workout, the international scouting, Jeff Stoutland saw all the potential that was there. And one of the things he talks about in this interview on PhiladelphiaEagles.com is how Jeffrey Lurie will say to him, and I find this interesting, Jeffrey Lurie will say to Jeff Stoutland, okay, that's what he is now, but what can he be in three years? And I love that down-the-road thinking from Jeffrey Lurie. I think that's great. But Jeff Stoutland will assess it and say, if this, that, and the other, then he will be this. Then this is what it will produce. And I think Jordan Mailata has exceeded whatever the expectation was even three years down the line. Because this is a guy that could be making his first Pro Bowl this year, and I think he will be making his first Pro Bowl this year. So Jeff Stoutland looks at Jordan Mailata, sees all this raw talent, and if I'm Jeff Stoutland, he's the biggest bragging point I could have. Because I got that raw talent and I turned it into maybe a perennial Pro Bowler taking over for a Hall of Famer in Jason Peters. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. So I love listening to him talking about uh, Jordan Mailata, and here he is talking about a great block that he had uh, in the game against the Lions and how he played it. And I'm doing this not so much to give you the background of Jordan Mailata, but just give you a little bit more of an insight as to the personality of Jeff Stoutman. Here he was on Eagles.com. Tremendous space right here on Jordan Mailata, which is dangerous. It's like your mom says, don't touch the stove when it's on. You know, it's dangerous. This is dangerous. Now, we know this, and we understand this. And so as soon as Mulata gets this up and under move, he's hearing my voice in meetings. He's hearing my voice on the field. It's dangerous. You must be on high alert for this type of action. So you see him here come back and see the sense of urgency in him trying to snatch this defender so he can't get through. And then he, he should have a little bit better balance. But I think he was so excited to, to stop the penetration that, you know, he maybe overdid it a little bit. But a uh, tremendous job by Jordan of shutting down the penetrator and then coming off for the looper. It's dangerous. Like Bob said, don't touch the stove when it's on. It's dangerous. Uh, intense is all hell. I mean, he's intense with the media in press conferences. And I don't know too many people like that. Like Dan Campbell's pretty intense, even though he's probably going to get fired. Uh, but uh, just intense all the time. And if you watch that whole thing, you can check it out on PhiladelphiaEagles.com. It's it's just great. And that definitely gives you that insight to the personality that is coaching these offensive linemen up. Like Jack Driscoll, for instance, that never played on the left side of the uh, – or excuse me, played, never played left tackle before. And all of a sudden he's going out there and he's throwing bodies around. Uh, it, it, it all comes down to the coaching of one guy, and that's Jeff Stout. So anything I can find out about him, I'm all for 100%. Uh, I want to switch gears to basketball. Like I mentioned, Phillies or excuse me, Sixers are going up to uh, Toronto tonight. Seven thirty tip off against the uh, Toronto Raptors. I caught an interview yesterday that got me thinking. Here, uh, Brian Windhorse, ESPN, was on. Pardon the interruption. And I caught an interview with him where he was saying the Sixers are playing Houston Rockets style basketball, like James Harden. Houston Rocket style basketball. I said, well, well, that's funny. You got a PJ Tucker. You got James Harden. Uh, you got uh, who was it? Daniel House. You got all these former Rockets joining Daryl Morey's Rockets North, Northeast Rockets, whatever we're calling it now. And now the style of play is being compared to that of the Houston Rockets. I I, I know some people don't like Brian Windhorst. I don't I I'm, I don't mind Brian Windhorst at all, but I don't agree with this at all. I think it's a a bit of a easy, low-hanging fruit comparison to look at the Sixers right now when, especially now that we know Joel Embiid is not 100%, he is still working his way back into game shape after off-season plantar fasciitis that Doc Rivers highlighted the other day. Wish we would have known that going into the season, so I knew to grade my man on a curve. But um, I think anytime you see James Harden, who, yes, is seems to be in the best shape he's been in in about four years, Anytime you see James Harden dropping 30 plus points, getting triple double, close to triple double numbers every single night. Anytime you see that, and oh, by the way, it, it, it being the star of the show, which he has been to this point through four games this season, then yeah, yeah, you're anytime you see that, you're gonna think about Houston Rockets, James Harden, and Houston Rockets basketball, because James Harden was Houston Rockets basketball for nearly a decade. So yeah, I think it's an easy comparison, low-hanging fruit comparison to make. I don't think it's intentional right now of the 76ers 
to be playing Houston Rockets style basketball from the, you know, from 2018. All right. I don't think that's what they're trying to do. I think that is a result of Joel Embiid not being ready to go for whatever reason, but bottom line, not being, uh, being ready to go for the first four games of this season. I think as the season goes on and you start to see more from Joel Embiid and you start to see more from uh, or more of what you saw from Joel Embiid in years past, that's where you'll start to see more of this being Joel Embiid's team again. Right now, without question, it's James Harden's team. James Harden is the star of the show. James Harden is the one that's making everything happen. James Harden is the playmaker on this team. But until we see 100% from Joel Embiid, uh, we're not going to see anything different. We're going to see the easy comparison to that of James Harden and the Rockets. My point of bringing this up is I don't want people thinking that all of a sudden Doc Rivers is shifting gears to James Harden being the focal point of this offense. They're going to live and die with what James Harden does. I'm saying this because I think Doc Rivers right now is coaching to what he has. And right now he has a better roster. And this team still has a lot of figuring out to do. And I think a guy like Matisse Steibel not being as involved in the lineup as he has been in, in years past isn't so much a detriment to his style or his game. It's more so that you have increased the role. You have increased the talent that is on that bench right now. And he's got a lot better people to climb over. So he's not going to be a guy competing with Danny Green to be in the starting lineup. He's a guy competing with guys like House, guys like uh, D'Anthony Melton, guys like George Niang coming off the bench to help this team win. It's a much better roster. And I think Doc Rivers is still very much trying to figure out the, the proper rotation. And we all know that that has been a bit of a problem for Doc Rivers. It was a problem, of course, for Brett Brown to figure out the proper rotation. Well, now you probably have the deepest team of the process post-process era the actual process, not not the now and the actual the actual process you went through, not just Joel Embiid. But in the post-process area, you probably have the deepest team that you've ever had. So when you look at Joel Embiid and what he has done so far this season, you're talking about a guy who's playing himself back into game shape. But you're also talking about a guy who does have one 40-point game under his belt already this season. And a guy that to this point has only had one disappointing game, uh, and that's uh, how he played against the Milwaukee Bucks. I feel like once he establishes himself again, as far as getting back into game shape, you're going to see them return to Joel Embiid's team. I think James Harden is going to look great for the first month of the season. Joel Embiid then establishes himself yet again as an MVP candidate. And then I think you start to see a better cohesive unit going down. Not one guy for the most part dominating for the first three of the four games of this regular season. So I don't think any style has changed. I think it's just a matter of waiting for Joel Embiid to get his feet back under him for the season to start. For him to be another MVP candidate. Now, bottom line, I think Joel Embiid is going to play himself back in the shape. And if James Harden continues to play at a high level, regardless of stats, all right, because I don't think it's going to be a good measuring stick for this. Yeah, triple doubles are great, and a lot of assists is what I want him to concentrate on. I think that's the most sustainable thing. But 25 to 30 point games every single night. I don't know if that's sustainable for this year's or for this version of James Harden at 33 years of age. I think this is going to be something for James Harden and Joel Embiid to work out where they are going to be the two biggest stars on this team without question. And you're going to see those guys carry this team, hopefully to at least the Eastern Conference Finals. When I look at these two players, I see a guy, I see guys that have to be haymakers, both left-handed and right-handed, coming at opponents every single possession and Joel Embiid once he plays himself back into that shape I think you're going to see a very close version of James Harden to what we're seeing right now you're going to see that version for the rest of the season the points are going to be there the points are not going to be there at the rate that they have been at so far for James Harden but once you get him and Joel Embiid clicking on all cylinders that's where I think you're going to see the style of offense that the Sixers will play for the vast majority of the season. The first four games right now, I think, are a bit of a tease in that I don't think we're going to see a guy like James Harden averaging close to 30 points per game for the rest of the season. I think the assist numbers will be there, and those will only grow as Joel Embiid continues to uh, get in better shape. But I, th I don't think James Harden is going to maintain this level, but I think there's still a much better version of uh, Joel Embiid once he gets his feedback on him to start the season. That will be the tall tale sign to see what this team brings you throughout the rest of the year, not just in terms of success with wins and losses, but in terms of overall style. 
So the Houston Rockets thing kind of got to me because I think that's become that low-hanging fruit that people have talked about because of the Daryl Morey offseason trades, because right now how well James Harden is playing. And when we see James Harden play at that level, right away in our minds we go to the Houston Rockets. And I think we're going to have enough Houston talk for the next two weeks. So I don't need it right now. Maybe that's what it is. Damn you, Astros. Damn you, Texans, next Thursday, a week from the, uh, tomorrow. Don't need it. Don't need it at all. Uh, all right, we're going to get, get to Evan Macy in just a second. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. How can I talk about basketball and not mention Ben Simmons? Uh, one other thing I did get from that Brian Windhorst interview, I didn't realize, I knew Ben Simmons had only fouled out a couple of times with the Sixers, but six years in Philadelphia, four times he fouled out. Ben Simmons fouled out of four games over a six-year period in Philadelphia. Ben Simmons has fouled out twice in three games. With the Brooklyn Nets. You know, it's fun. It's just fun. I just, it's fun. Oh, who cares about Ben Simmons? I do. Because, you know, as long as he's not doing well, the Sixers won that trade, and Philadelphia can say, we told you so, to the rest of the world. So there you go. That's fun. Um, <laughs> let me tell you about Steven Singer. Of Steven Singer Jewelers. You've heard of the gold dip roses. You've heard of the diamonds. But have you heard of the perfect price? Because that's what you get with everything at Steven Singer Jewelers. The other corner of 8th and Walnut online at IHateStevenSinger.com. That's IHateStevenSinger.com. When it comes to diamonds, when it comes to the dazzling diamonds, and it comes to getting engaged, there's no one you should trust more than Steven Singer, who's been in the love business in, for, in Philadelphia for over 40 years. Ready for love, diamond engagement ring, standing by at the ready. So when you're ready to pop the question, Ready for love, diamond engagement rings. Or when you walk into the other corner of 8th and Walnut and you get treated like family, you're going to have a real jewelry expert walk you through the, all, all, all the beautiful, dazzling diamond inventory. So do what I do. When it comes to jewelry, trust one man. The man with the perfect price. The man at the other corner of 8th and Walnut, Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers. One place, one price, the perfect price online at IHateStevenSinger.com. Always fast and free shipping at IHateStevenSinger.com. Let's shovel in a little bit more into this World Series conversation with my man Evan Macy of PhillyVoice.com. Right now, the Roth Orthopedic guest slide from PhillyVoice.com. Mr. Evan Macy joins us. Evan, I, uh, I, I, from what we had just talked about before I hit record, you must be on fumes right now. It's obnoxious. I, uh, I honestly, in my wildest dreams, didn't think that the Phillies would make this run. It's almost like my bluff being called because, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to really make a plan for Philly Voice. Um, I hate to give the inside baseball, but. Honestly, I was so unprepared for the playoff run that happened that I was just kind of spontaneously trying to cover this team with duct tape and bailing wire. And we're going to do a, a much more comprehensive team job here as they play in the World Series. But this has been just nuts. I did not expect any of this at all. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sure. Look, when was the moment that you were that you you thought you had to take this team seriously? Because I mean, in all honesty, I expected them to make the playoffs when the season started. When Joe Girardi was the manager, I did not expect them to make the playoffs <laughs> shortly after. Uh, and then Rob Thompson helps turn this thing around. When did you start to really take notice to this team and realize, oh, wow, we got to do some planning over here at Philly Voice? It's it's hard to not use emotion. Like, you want to use logic. But it's This is such an emotional run. So the Reese Hoskins home run um, against the Braves was really a moment – like these runs have these moments. Like I remember I was in college for the 08 Phillies and there's so many distinct memories. Obviously, you know, the, the home run Victorino in, in Los, Los Angeles comes to mind. But like there's just all of these moments, the crazy ninth inning against, um, against the Cardinals. And then there's the Reese Hoskins home run against um, the Braves. And then honestly, can this beat the, the Astros? Can they compete with the Astros? I mean, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I first I was like, okay, I believe they can make the playoffs. Then I was like, okay, I believe that they can advance around in the playoffs. Then, okay, I believe they can make the World Series. And after what Bryce Harper did, uh, and Zach Wheeler and everybody in the clinching game, can they? Be, is this crazy? Can they beat the Astros? They won eighty-seven games. This isn't supposed to be happening, but. It's hard for me not to believe because every time I've doubted them, they've done something ridiculous. Like they're not doing it in mundane fashion. They're doing it in 
everyone's going to be talking about this for the rest of their lives fashion. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone says there's a team that gets hot at the right time. And I don't think that applies to the Phillies because they like the right time is September. Oh, they got hot at the right time when everybody else was falling apart, but they got hot in like, you know, July, August, and then September, they kind of hit a wall. I will say this though. They, they did gel at the right time and the right time when they held on to keep their playoff spot over the Brewers, the right time was that ninth inning, that eighth inning, that ninth inning against the Cardinals. That's when I think this team just started believing that they could do anything. It's also, it's so funny because I recall so many stories and takes back in the spring, just about how the, this team was put together with just a bunch of like, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but just like fat sluggers who can't play defense. Like that was basically what this team was. And they didn't have a lot of pitching depth and their bullpen was unreliable. And it's amazing that it's actually paying off. They have so many different options on offense that can carry the team that to cut, to shut them all down is almost impossible for an opposing pitcher. These, you know, the Phillies are doing this against guys like you Darvish. Uh, they're doing it again. You know, I mean, the Braves had some really good. All of the starters that they faced, the top two or three starters for all the teams they played in these playoffs, have shut down stuff. And for somebody stepped up, uh, and it's really tough. You have Kyle Schwarber, who's just like an annoying leadoff hitter who hits home runs, and and Real Muto's the best catcher in baseball, and Harper's the MVP, and you have Castellanos who can do it, and then Reese Hoskins is just makes no sense. He's never going to buy another beer for himself in Philadelphia. <laughs> it's a murderer's row. And then they have, you know, the, the, the young guys too. Boehm has been cold lately, but he can, you know, knock a couple of base hits in a game and become a threat. And Stott has a couple of clutch hits. And you have guys who can play defense, you know, in center and Brandon Marsh. I know I'm just reading the players basically, but they're, they're good. It's a good roster. It's, it's, it's working. It's really, I'm, I'm curious to see how this, especially if they win, how this influences the way that major league ball front offices build teams. Cause this is a different way to build a team and it's working. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing that I keep on reminding myself, I mean, like some people myself included will do the comparison, especially if they win versus like the 2017 Philadelphia Eagles winning the super bowl. Oh, it's like that, that was a team that was decimated with injury yet. They rose above and they won. This is a team that you have your MVP, you have this over-the-luxury tax spending going on here. So in a lot of ways, they underachieved for a long time up yep. until the playoffs started. So it's like you talk about building a team. Oh, they spent money, and they might have spent even more money this this next offseason, especially if they, they win or they, get, they feel like they were just right there with the Astros. But really, it seems like – this is a team, as you mentioned, you, run, you mentioned the guys on the roster, but the depth offensively with this lineup is really what I think has carried them to this point. Absolutely. They, they depth where it matters. Uh, I guess something I should mention is I cannot believe the pitching after F. Nola and Wheeler. Mm -hmm. That is something that I, I, you know, I went to both of the, they had both of their bullpen, bullpen games from home. I was at both of those games and I was fully prepared you know, for the series to shift the other way. And somehow they won both of these games. I can't believe it. They didn't really have a starter. You know, they had Bailey Falter started and didn't even get through the first inning when they allowed runs in game four. And, like, they they bounced back. They, they you know, their bullpen didn't really give up any more. I, I can't believe the way that every single piece is working. I mean, we're not here. The Phillies are not here if not for all of this stuff, like they're there, it might look dominating in the stat line, but if there's one dude who's not doing what he's doing, not here, they've, they really walked a tightrope and everybody's contributed. And it's, it's pretty impressive to see. No, no question. Now, uh, when it comes to Rob Thompson as the Philly skipper, we could all talk about the, the chemistry and his overall effect on the, the clubhouse and all that. But this guy was unloading pitchers, uh, especially the Ranger Suarez start in game three of this series. And I'm thinking, you know, tomorrow exists. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, he just said to hell with it and just kept throwing guys out there. What have you made of him pushing the buttons along the way throughout this postseason? Some of the moves have been questionable, but they've worked. I mean, it's, it's impressive, you know, the way that he – lined up the pitchers for the final game was was odd and he had he had remember he had robertson and robertson got two men on and then he went to eflin and got a gut feeling he knows these players he's he's making moves 
based on the relationships that he has with guys and based on like building confidence with guys through one-on-one -on -one conversations. I mean, he's just, like this quiet, confident, stoic baseball genius, I guess. <laughs> and, you know, he's not really going with like, okay, uh, then he has the ninth and Robertson has the eighth and Eflin has the seventh and Alvarez has the sixth. He's, 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 he, there's no roadmap. He's just kind of, all right, this is the situation. This is who's due up. And this is what I saw from a dude in his warm up session. I'm going to pull ever on him. And it's really interesting. He's kind of fly by the seat of his pants. And it's, um, it's, it's tough, like as a sports writer, condition to like expect, you know, you expect the, the regular closer to, to finish the game. He's had so many different guys get a look in the ninth inning. It's, it, you know, there's no real reliability on how he's going to, how he's going to make decisions but they're working he's obviously going on gut he obviously knows something we don't mm -hmm. yeah it's it's weird I, I agree with you you talk about the bullpen and i always was raised in the baseball world of pitchers are creatures of habit they need to yep. know when to start getting ready and when to stretch and the long whatever it might be um and he's completely thrown out the window now uh reese hoskins is an interesting case here and you mentioned the depth here but reese hoskins hits have all come in like clutch situations i mean there's the one exception game two he had a home run where game was still out of hand but it's like you need a two-run home run reese hoskins stepped up there whether they're walking schwarber or schwarber gets on base he steps up and he hits a home run it seems like he has really come into his own in the postseason for what the phillies groomed him to be throughout his minor league and now uh, major league career i guess so it you know, I wrote about roster construction when the series started because um, a lot of people were comparing the Phillies and the Padres, um, and it, it makes a, a lot of sense. They're both kind of big market teams, but they're not the premier teams, and they've both spent a lot of money, and they've both made splashy moves for stars. But when I dove into it further, the thing that I found to be the most interesting was that they don't have anybody from their farm system on this team. They have one out of 25 is a guy from the farm system. They have 14 of the Padres players were acquired via a trade, wow. which isn't to knock their farm system. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they use those players to build their team in trades. Um, but you always think of the Phillies as a team that are not drafting well, all of the busted first-round picks. But when you look at it, the homegrown talent that has contributed to the Phillies is actually impressive. You have Hoskins, like you said, who's just a clutch animal. We've not seen anything like this in a really long time. But you have Alec Bohm and Bryson Stott, and you have Sir Anthony Dominguez, and you have Aaron, uh, Aaron, uh, ugh, Aaron Jones. <laughs> it's it's been a long it's been a long one. You have Aaron, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and so on and so on. And there's you know uh, these players who've come up through Philadelphia, and Hoskins, one of them. And you have to wonder. You know, there's a difference between being a mercenary and being a lifer with a team. And I'm, I'm really wondering if what Hoskins has gone through, I mean, he was enemy number one or whatever. There's a lot of enemies here. He was on the end uh, for a while with Philly fans. Uh, and for whatever reason, he's just able to, um, I don't know, he's able to find that clutch gene and be and, and, and come through. And I think the fact that the Phillies have some of these guys who've been here a really long time makes us even more special i mean at least in the clubhouse it's really special for these guys and i think it's special because we've seen hoskins troubles and tribulations and he's kind of you know he's one of our guys maybe he's back the next season because of this who knows mm -hmm. yeah I, it certainly seems like it'd be difficult to move after five home runs to this point in the postseason <laughs> yeah. um well, looking at this houston astros lineup looking at this rotation Obviously, the experience jumps out to anybody for World Series six years is pretty impressive. Uh, so when you look at this roster of the Astros from afar, what jumps out to you immediately? I think the experience that you said is is really huge. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much that really plays a factor as far as like once you're playing a game, you're playing a game. There's a lot of off off field stuff that the Phillies are going to have to do with that they're not used to. It'll be interesting. They have this long break for the series, um, and I'm curious if that's going to be um, good or bad, just because they've had so much momentum playing like every day basically. Uh, the Astros are kind of having the downtime, and the Astros um, they they're going to be able to be at home and be comfortable. And I don't know. On paper, it's it's got to be Astros. I'm sure the betting line is very skewed. Um, <laughs> I mean, they might be the biggest underdog in the World Series in a while. But if you just kind of eliminate looking at it on paper and you just kind of look at what they've done the last two weeks, 
it's hard to discount the Phillies because they have the starting pitching and they have the hitting and their bullpen has been good. And those are really the three aspects. Uh, the Phillies have scored in lots of ways. They've, you know, gotten on base and, and created runs. You saw the, the, in the Cardinals series, they were able to get hit by pitches and walks to have a rally. And then of course, all of the clutch home runs. So they can do it in a lot of different ways. And um, I don't know if I would pick, the Phillies to beat the Astros, but I don't think it's going to be a sweep. I think they have a chance. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be, I thought that this would have been true earlier. I think it's going to come down to those non Nola Wheeler games. It's going to come down to those bullpen games. Um, I think, you know, when they have their top two starters up against, uh, you know, uh, the top two starters like Verlander over with the Astros, I think those are going to be pitchers duels that the Phillies can probably win with a clutch hit or two. But can they shut down the Astros throwing everything but the kitchen sink at them with a bullpen game? Mm-hmm. If they can do that, I'll be a true believer. That's still <laughs> something that I'm um, uh, hesitant to have confidence can work, what, three, four times now? Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to th- this easy question, not easy question, but I think very simple question, and it's uh, along the lines of what the hell are they thinking? Uh, what the hell is Major League Baseball thinking not having the World Series start for essentially a week. There's a week. It's like you have a bye week. The NFL yeah. obviously has Monday Night Football. They have Thursday Night Football, of course. Uh, they got Sunday Night Football. But, and then Sunday you're competing with baseball all day. Anyway, why would baseball, why would Major League Baseball decide, I guess, to have this long layoff between the last game of the championship series, league championship series, and the World Series? Why have that long layoff? So Tuesday is supposed to be game seven of the NLCS. It was not necessary. So Mm -hmm. in the, in their, and the, and the uh, ALCS was a game behind. So in their defense, it was supposed to be the series finished Tuesday and Wednesday. You got media day Thursday, and then you got game one Friday, Saturday schedule's been set. I've been obsessively checking start times (laughs) and schedules because I'm going on flights and stuff and it's been nuts. So this has been the schedule and they play Friday, Saturday, and then there's off Sunday. Uh, in Houston, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in Philly, and then off for when the Eagles, the Texans, because that's just bizarre. And then they play on Saturday, so it's it's designed to maximize viewers and not go up against the NFL. There's not going to be a World Series game on Sunday, and then the following week, there's not going to be a World Series game on Thursday. So that's why they did it. Um, it would have been cool if it just kind of the World Series started the day after things were wrapped up with both teams. That that would have been nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but, hey, we get to talk about it and write about it for, like, a week and build anticipation and get some pages and some views. And so, I mean, it's fine with me. Yeah, go get them clicks. Yeah, go exactly. get them clicks. <laughs> uh, by the way, thank you. You were at the Sixers game. Uh, now, the time we air this, two nights ago, you and your lovely wife, you brought them luck. They got their first one of the season. So, hopefully, the Phillies take care of business against the Houston Astros quickly. This way, you and the missus can get the more Sixers games and bring them more wins. How about that? It- if the Sixers want to give me and my wife season tickets so that they keep winning, we definitely can do that. I will say she's from Houston. I don't want to start a whole oh, thing. She, oh. um, she's from Houston. She had her Astro shirt underneath her Iverson shirt. Um, and she had a couple of beers. I'm starting to take the Iverson shirt off. And I was, I was basically holding it on with both hands that she can get me killed on the way out. But um, <laughs> if the more Sixers games, I'm going to make her leave the Astro shirt at home. Gotcha. There you go. That's that's a healthy marriage right there. That's a healthy marriage. Yeah. Uh, Evan, <laughs> Evan, Evan Macy. Oh, so all right. Last thing. And now it doesn't start till Friday. What are you expecting? You mentioned you know, uh, you know the close series here, not a sweep. What are you expecting if you if you wrote the script as a prediction for this series? I honest, I think they can spend two games to come back to Philadelphia. If they don't, it's going to be a completely different vibe. I think if they somehow get one of these two games against the pitchers and then take the home field advantage as they had all the other series i think the phillies can win it i really think the first two games are going to determine it i being down two games to the astros is too big a hole um i think they can get one get to one one i really do um and then when they come to philly they haven't lost yet so who knows what happens um so i'm gonna i'm gonna politely decline to make a prediction but i don't think it's a sweep and i think the phillies have a chance there we go. Um, that's all That's all I need right now, at least. That's all I need right now. Evan right. Macy, Philly Voice, phillyvoice.com. Much appreciated. I'm sure we'll talk to you, uh, hopefully, as the series goes on and in the offseason as well. Evan, thank you so much. Thanks. Absolutely. Evan Macy joining us on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line.
My thanks to Evan Macy joining the show, phillyvoice.com. I did not know. So his wife, I didn't know this. His wife is from Houston. He was telling this before uh, we uh, we hit the old uh, record, right? Uh, the record button there is that his wife is originally from Houston. They went to the Sixers game and they saw their first win of the season, which is nice. Uh, and yeah, she had uh, under her Iverson jersey, she had a, um, did, she, did you say a Texans jersey? Whatever the hell it was. Uh, but he's like, yeah, you might want to keep that covered up. I want to keep that covered up. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, my thanks to Evan, uh, talking about the world series there with me. Let me tell you right now, but the great people at manscaped manscaped.com use promo code Farzy for 20% off your manscaped order. Manscaped's got it all, including their platinum package 4.0, their best bundle yet. When it comes to grooming, join 4 million men worldwide who trust manscaped and their skin safe technology that helps reduce the risk of nicks so you can manscape with confidence and comfort their platinum package 4.0 includes the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer and like i said it all comes with skin safe technology in that great bundle so join those 4 million men worldwide use manscaped to manscaped.com use promo code farzy for 20 percent off how about Freestone Farm CBD? FreestoneFarmCBD.com. Use promo code Farzy for 20% off. If you enjoy CBD, if you want to try a different CBD, if you want to try CBD in general, Freestone Farm CBD is the way to go. They grow all their premium hemp flower in the garden state with no organic inputs or IPM, and you'll enjoy their tropical tasting Bay Oxes. Their strain menu is amazing. And the Tropical Tasting Bay Ox clocks into the chart topping 24.1%. And Super CBD, which is half Hindu. Kush. And 21%. Genetics of these guys pff, are off the charts. So trust Freestone Farm CBD. Helps you to wind down after a workout. Helps you wind down at the end of the day. FreestoneFarmCBD.com. Use promo code Farzy. How about the amazing people of Mojo? I'll be out there a little bit later on today at the Art Museum talking to some great people. Hopefully the weather holds out as we'll do a Farzy in the field presented by Mojo. Mojo has over 300 skilled players in the NFL from quarterbacks to tight ends, from wide receivers to running backs. And each player has a share price attached to them. You could buy low and sell high. Miles Sanders at a low right now. Now's a good time to buy. Probably, probably only going to get better. Jalen Hurts, same deal. You might be able to get him a little bit better at the end of the season, but right now I think his stock is only going to go up. The whole idea right now is to buy low on these players and then sell high. Each player has a share price attached to him. You can look at guys right now like Paris Campbell, for instance. He's going off at $3.37. He is up 13%, almost 14% with his 10 reception, 70-yard game and a touchdown just last week. Also look at Kenneth Walker. I mentioned him yesterday, the rookie for Seattle. His share price is going up right now. Now's a good time to buy. It's only going to go up. That Seattle team's having a great start to their season, minus Russell Wilson. You know, it's not having a great start to the season. Russell Wilson's team now. So there you go. The Denver Broncos. Uh, but yeah, so check it all out there on the Mojo app. Available in New Jersey. Must be present in New Jersey to trade on Mojo. Download the app to your phone right now. Get a, uh, get a chance to win $10,000 in share value when it comes to the Mojo app. Download it right now on your phone. Available in New Jersey and must be in New Jersey to trade on Mojo. It must be 21 or older. Gambling problem called 1-800-GAMBLER. Have a PHL Sports Station, Philadelphia Sports Station, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. How about phlsportsnation.com? Let's jump into the chat check today. Not as often as usual today, but we'll see what's going on. Kevin, what's going on? April, hello. <laughs> April, thank you. Yes, uh, anything with oils is a terrible idea after spicy food. Milk is always good to go uh, to fix it. That's what I figured. But here is the problem. I tried some of the milk. We didn't have a lot of milk left in the house. And my daughter, when she grew, when she gets up, when she grows up, when she gets up in the morning, she likes to crush milk, as a lot of kids do, right? So uh, we only had a little bit left. So as the loving, being the loving father that I am, I opened up the refrigerator. I saw there was only a little bit of milk. I poured myself a little bit, enough, enough where I knew she would have her milk in the morning before I'd go out and get more milk. No milk will ever be our milk. Anyway, so um, she... Uh, I leave it in there, have a little sip, and I'm like, I need more. And I'm like, nope, don't take any more because then she won't have it in the morning. And that's when I was like, oh, let's give peanut butter a shot. 
horrible idea. Like I said, grease fire. And the oil in the peanut butter totally makes sense. Thank you, April. Uh, Mally, if the Phillies win the World Series, you need Mark with no shirt and uh, the twerking penguin. Mally, anyone that's never been in the chat before but seeing that comment, I only can imagine what they might be thinking right now. What kind of show? Is, is there an OnlyFans account for this show? A topless Mark Farzetta and a twerking penguin. What kind of sick crap are these people into? Nothing. It's just to help the Phillies win, baby. And if you are new to the chat, this is the twerking penguin. I'm not going to make the penguin twerk, nor am I going to take my shirt off. But just so you know, I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to set the stage. This is the official Christmas penguin given to me by my Ukrainian neighbor for my three-year-old daughter. It's a penguin that twerks. They do things differently in the Ukraine. They do things differently in Europe in general. But anyway, stand with the Ukraine, by the way. Uh, let's see here. Uh, man must be said a lot. Uh, <laughs> Sean Gillespie, good morning, man. Uh, that man must sell a lot of mattresses to place a bet like that. Damn. You know, I... I'll try to look it up, but uh, when Mattress Mac made the Super Bowl bet for the Patriots, for the Patriots, for the Chiefs and the Buccaneers, I remember thinking, "Oh no, this is the start of the next generation. There's no way Patrick Mahomes loses this." And sure enough, Patrick Mahomes lost it. Um, and, but Mattress Mac made like some kind of the number three and three quarter million dollars. Um jumps out in my mind that mattress mac okay he won 3.4 million well all it says is texas texas man this man was well known before that uh furniture store owner known as mattress mac laid down 3.46 million dollars on the underdog tampa bay buccaneers at plus three and a half uh it does not say what his payout. He wagered 3.46. Okay, yeah, here's more of his history. He had more than $11 million in play on the 2019 World Series between the Astros and the Nationals, including a $3.5 million uh, furniture bet on the Astros if he that he placed with uh, DraftKings. Okay. Uh Astros came up short. Of, we know how the, the Nationals won that. So that's one bet he lost. So that's a good sign. That's a good sign for us. All right. Yeah, I can't. I don't see his payout. Largest bet reported Super Bowl for the Super Bowl in terms of amount risk is believed to be four point eight million. It was wagered on the Rams to beat the Patriots. Well, that didn't work out well in two thousand two. So there you go. Uh, so he made a bet of three point four million, and I'm I'm not getting the payout. Whatever the matter, I don't know somebody can do the math there, but uh, yeah, it's not giving me the numbers in terms of what he won, unfortunately. But yeah, three point four million. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. A lot of money right there. So he's got a history doing it. Apparently, the last time he did it on the World Series, he lost. So that's a good sign for the Phillies. Bottom line right there. All right, back to the chat check. Um, April binged the Kelsey Brothers podcast yesterday. Good stuff. I don't doubt that. Uh, Tyvita. Good morning, Tyvita. Sean Gillespie. No one, and I mean no one, could have predicted the Phillies did this season. What the Phillies did this season. The Titanic captain. What? <laughs> Bryce injured uh beating Atlanta in the playoffs to the World Series. Yeah, everything. It's a nuts. It's absolutely crazy. You have to Oh, interesting. April, you have to swish the milk around then spit it out. If you swallow it, it just uh it ingests the spiciness again. I'm full of mistakes. I'm full of mistakes. My kid is sitting here and just said, what did he say about the twerky? <laughs> April, my kid is sitting here and just said, what did he say about a twerking penguin? Do I need to just to, I mean, for educational purposes, do I need to, I mean, 
There we go. Just so educational purposes, educational. Ari, what's up, Ari? Good morning. All right, just for educational purposes. Here you go. Just educational purposes. All right. Sorry, I didn't say that this show was going to be NC-17 today, but there you go. Uh, T-Bro! T-Bro loves the person. <laughs> she says, April, she says, yeah, okay, well, there, she, there we go. That was just for her. That was just for her. Uh, and congratulations on her karate. All right. Uh, Sean Gillespie, uh, Moriari came in, uh, did come in at the right time. Boy, did you? You ain't kidding. That's the working penguin, everyone. Uh, thanks to everybody in the chat. Check. You guys are phenomenal. Let's get into the morning rush. Watch by Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. Ari says, I miss most of the show, but I'm glad I got the penguin. Penguin's all yours, friend. Uh, like I said, Sixers tonight. Here's what I'm looking forward to seeing. I was talking about the, the, the stats and all the stuff with the Sixers. Uh, and the stats are great. Stats are fine. But I, I am looking for more of to see, because I believe the best version of the 76ers, where Joel Embiid is at his absolute best. 40-point uh, game, although they lost it. It was nice to see him get 40 points. Uh, him get 26 points that he got the other night uh, in their first win of the season, that's even better to see against the Pacers. And the fact that they closed out that game, even better to see. Keep on rolling. Keep that going, and I think they will keep that going tonight with the Sixers in Toronto. So I look forward to uh, watching that game tonight. Again, 7.30 tip-off uh, tonight uh, in Toronto. So we can all, uh, hopefully, Sixers get a nice, they improved a 2-3 and three on the season with a victory there. That would be great. I'm trying to get the line for you guys. Um, I thought I had it in my notes. I do not, because I'm an idiot. Um, oh, yeah, okay, minus one. Sixers minus one going into tonight. So there you go. Uh, James Harden's averaging just under 27 points per game. Uh, Joel Embiid, uh, a little bit over 11 rebounds. Uh, James Harden, 9.8 assists. I said by the end of the season, that's going to be about 12. 12 assists per game, I think, is what James Harden is going to be at uh, by the end of the season. So that's where the Sixers are at tonight. Flyers got some bad news yesterday. James Van Riemsdyk out for an undisclosed amount of time. Broken finger for JVR. Was looking pretty good this year as well. Uh, and you know what? This got me thinking because I totally forgot about this. Travis Konecny got benched by Elaine Vigneault. Travis Konecny just got benched by John Tortorella. Things are not going well for Travis Konecny. <laughs> now, Kevin Hayes also got benched. I mentioned that yesterday. Uh, but I got more faith in Kevin Hayes than I do uh, TK. He's now been benched twice by two different coaches. So that's definitely where you got to start looking in the mirror. Uh, so that's what I got for you today. Um, folks, tomorrow, uh, well, today, I should say, I'm going to be joined uh, at 1 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be taping the interview with uh, former Phillies relief pitch pitcher in 2008 uh, World Series champion Scott Ayer will be joining the program. Uh, so we'll tape that interview today, this afternoon. I look forward to that. And then Scott Ayer will join the show tomorrow. So we'll play that for you tomorrow. Look forward to that. Uh, I will say I met Scott Ayer once. If you don't know much about Scott Ayer, I met him one time and I thought he was phenomenally um, uh, articulate, a phenomenal storyteller, funny guy, and typical crafty lefty out of the pen. So I look forward to having that conversation with him today, and I look forward to playing that for you guys tomorrow. In the meantime, have a, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday, hopefully a dry Wednesday, that is, in terms of the rain and the precipitation, wherever you are in the country. I know this area is still going to have a little bit of rain. So, uh, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzy Show, presented by Stephen Singer of Stephen Singer Jewelers. Jim Hyden produced the program, did a wonderful job. It's a Buzz Sports Entertainment production. Have a great day, everybody. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Go Sixers. See ya.